I'm Mari Pilling, and you're listening to a true crime podcast. And I have a question. Are we dead yet? This is the terrifying case carried out by the Beast of Chicago, more commonly known as H.H. Holmes. Let me take you back to Gilmanton, New Hampshire on May 16th, 1861, the day Herman Webster Mudgett, also known as H.H. Holmes, was born. Holmes was the youngest of three and very fortunate as a young child. He grew up in a strict Methodist household and his parents were wealthy farmers. His family was able to afford his education. He was said to be unusually intelligent at a very early age. Still, there were some haunting signs of what was yet to come. Since he had easy access to animals, he reportedly liked to torment and torture and even sometimes practice surgery on them. Some accounts indicate that he may have been responsible for a death of a friend. Once he graduated high school at 16, he moved on to college to study medicine and human dissection. He became very interested in the macabre. During his undergrad, he dropped out of the University of Vermont and then transferred to the University of Michigan, where he started his career of crime. Before he successfully graduated, he would steal the corpses from the medical labs and use them to make false insurance claims. He also may have used the bodies for experiments for his own interest and pleasure. Once he received his degree, he married his first wife, Clara, in 1878. He was only about 19 years old. Two years later, the couple had a son, but it was not a happy marriage. The domestic violence had continued until Holmes ultimately left and deserted his wife and child, and he went off and married Murda Belknap in 1887, whom he eventually had a daughter with even though he had yet to divorce Clara. He filed for divorce a few weeks later, but the papers never went through. Finally, a few years later, he married Georgina Yoke on January 17, 1894 in Denver, Colorado. Technically, Holmes was still married to all three women, Clara, Murda, and Georgina, when he died. Holmes never liked to stay in one city for too long. He liked moving from place to place because it was a good way to keep all of his aliases intact. There had already been two occasions where he was connected to the killings of some young boys. One boy disappeared after being seen with Holmes, and the other died from taking medication from the pharmacy where Holmes worked. In the end, the boy's deaths were never linked to Holmes. Once he had moved to Chicago in 1885, he had started working at another local pharmacy in Inglewood on the south side of Chicago, and he had started using his infamous alias, Dr. Henry H. Holmes. He soon found himself running the business all alone after the widow who owned the pharmacy, uh, mysteriously disappeared. Holmes took over the business and grew it successfully, largely by charming the neighborhood women. While all of this was going on, it suspected that he was still committing insurance fraud by stealing and mutilating corpses and medical cadavers to pretend that they were victims of accidents just to collect money. After he took over the business full-time, Holmes had a three-story building constructed nearby. Located at 63rd and Wallace Street, he called it the World's Fair Hotel. It took quite a while to finish the project. Holmes would swindle his way out of paying the contractors after their work was done. Every so often, he'd fire the contractors if he thought they knew too much about the building. Once the contractors left or got fired, Holmes would simply hire another crew to finish the job. This scheme worked until the hotel was finished. In 1893, Holmes opened up his hotel for visitors. Unfortunately, many guests did not survive their stay in what would become known as the Murder Castle. The upper floors contained his living quarters and many small rooms where he ended up torturing and killing his victims. The blueprints included 51 doorways that opened up to brick walls and 100 windowless rooms. There were rooms with locks on the outside and gas nozzles on the inside, the vats of acid and the corridors that led to nowhere. There were also trap doors and chutes that helped him move the bodies down to the basement, where he could burn the remains in kilns or furnaces or dispose of them in other ways. Because of the nature in which he disposed the bodies and his wildly inconsistent stories and confessions, many of the facts about his case are still unclear. Holmes was still the only person who knew how to move through the infamous murder castle. No one knows for certain the total of numbers of victims he had killed, 
Many of them were women who were seduced, manipulated, and then killed. Holmes always had a plan to swindle and propose to his victims, and then his soon-to-be wife would suddenly disappear. Other victims were lured in by offers of employment. Before and especially during the World's Fair of 1893, Holmes tortured and killed scores of visitors. He became America's first serial killer, the Beast of Chicago. Holmes left Chicago shortly after the World's Fair to continue his schemes, including a plan with an associate named Benjamin Pitzel. The plan was that Pitzel would fake his own death to collect $10,000 from a life insurance company. Holmes didn't use a cadaver. Instead, he knocked Pitzel out with chloroform and then set him on fire. Later, after telling Pitzel's wife that her husband was still alive and in hiding, he convinced her to let him travel with three of her five children. Holmes later killed the three children belonging to Pitzel, and only two of the bodies were ever found buried within the hotel. Unfortunately, authorities did not catch on soon enough to stop his final murders. Holmes was rumored to have murdered his mistress, Julia Smith, and her daughter, Pearl. No one knows what happened to them since they went missing after staying at the hotel. After several weeks of outrunning authorities, Holmes was finally apprehended in November of 1894. Initially, the authorities had little evidence with which to convict him. The authorities eventually detained him on insurance fraud and for stealing a horse. When he was finally in custody, police asked him about his medical knowledge, and he gave numerous stories, but ultimately he accidentally admitted to having killed at least 27 people when he was asked about specific medical knowledge and techniques about rigor mortis. Holmes had no answer, and he eventually gave up and admitted defeat. In the end, police had only been able to confirm nine of those murders. No one really knows the true number of victims he slaughtered. Estimates of the total number of victims he had killed range from 20 to as many as 200 victims. After he was convicted in 1895, Holmes appealed his case to the courts but lost. He was charged with the murder of Pitzel and was sentenced to death by hanging. Before his death, Hearst newspapers paid Holmes for his confessions. He was given about $7,500. In today's economy, that money is roughly equivalent to $215,000. Holmes gave a number of contradictory accounts, which ultimately discredited him. He died on May 7, 1896. His last request was to be buried 10 feet under and encased in concrete because he did not want grave robbers to exhume and later dissect his body. The request was granted and he was buried in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The castle did not stand long. Its demise was hastened by an unknown arsonist and it was burned to the ground shortly after Holmes was arrested in 1894. It appears that after the fire, the building was largely rebuilt and turned into a warehouse which became somewhat abandoned, but continued to be used until January 1938, when it was purchased by the city of Chicago and is now used as a post office. Before the building was handed over to the city, the Chicago Tribune described the inside of the castle in a 1937 article there were rooms, rooms that, that had, had no, no doors. doors. There were doors that had no rooms. A mysterious house it was indeed. A crooked house. A reflection of the builder's own distorted mind. In that house occurred dark and eerie deeds. It had chimneys sticking out where chimneys didn't belong. Its stairways ended nowhere in particular. Winding passages brought the uninitiated with a frightful jerk back to where they had started from. It was truly the stuff of nightmares. There have been some conspiracies surrounding H.H. Holmes, one of which states that before he established himself in Chicago, Holmes traveled overseas to London. Theories state that he could have been none other than Jack the Ripper himself, but unfortunately there hasn't been any evidence to back this up. According to many newspapers and media outlets, most of the information on Holmes is unknown, some of the stories about these killings were over-exaggerated or completely made up by journalists during that time. No one truly knows the whole story. In the end, Holmes famously said, I was, I was born, born with the very devil in me. The inclination to murder came to me as naturally as the inspiration to do right when it comes to the majority of normal people. He was nothing but a sick sadist who liked to watch people suffer and feel pain. America's first 
serial killer. So I'm from Chicago, and before I did any research on Holmes, I had already heard some stories from my childhood. The first thing you should know about me is that I've always been a true crime fan my whole life, and I'm not exaggerating. My earliest memories were sitting in front of the living room TV watching Bones on cable. I think what's always interested me about true crime was that I always questioned why. I always wanted to find out what drove these people to kill, because it was all about nature versus nurture. I can talk for hours about specific cases, and I always have something to say because I've always been drawn to the strange mysteries. I named this podcast Are We Dead Yet because it shines light on the fact that everyone will die eventually, but everyone also has a story, especially the victims of these heinous crimes. My hope is that these stories will stay with you so you know how dark and twisted the world is, but to remind you how fortunate we all are to still be breathing. Thank you for listening to Are We Dead Yet? A true crime podcast hosted by Mari Pilling.